know this. It turns out that uh, you need spaces to speak and you need to be able to breathe. Speech depends on spaces and people constrain speech by constraining spaces. But this speech occurred in two places. It occurred on the ground as the kids were being sprayed. And it occurred in the hands of every person standing there and communicating with the rest of the world that says, this is us here laying our bodies. And if you spend the eight and a half minutes, you eventually see this community of students shouting at the cops, this is our space, not your space. And eventually the cops, you're safe, leave. And they leave. But they speak to all of us and communicate with all of us uh, as we move on. So where do we stand here again? The reason I'm doing it this way is because apparently there's not enough uh, length of cable to let me connect with my usual system. So how do we do this now? Okay. So then we move to Occupy Wall Street itself, uh, which, remember, New York City's parks were close to them overnight. So they used this narrow exception of Zuccotti Park, which was a, a public-private or a private space that was nonetheless publicly <coughs> open. And that's what allowed this piece of speech, one of the most significant protests in American recent memory, to change space, to occur. And again, central to the move was the capacity to record and speak yet again. And again, I'll try to figure this out. I don't use this. You might even find out later on why. But now we're using all sorts of forms of speech to speak about this. So this is from the day of the, uh, uh, of the removal itself. <laughs> now we're speaking by video to each other, but we're also speaking with a shared cultural space of understanding. Illegally, this is not fair use, the whole piece. This is how we speak to each other today. And a law that says that this is illegal is a law that restricts speech, no matter if you call it copyright or otherwise. And fundamentally, if we end up planting, if we end up planting an American flag or an American idea, Yeah, helmet and all, American First Amendment. But how do we communicate this to each other if not in this particular form? What are the spaces of the 21st century? And can we speak? If the only place to speak, as Marvin talks in his piece, is a mall, then you need to speak in a mall, because otherwise you're talking to four walls. If the only space that you can speak effectively to people is through their devices, because that's the space we occupy together, then that is the space we occupy together. Where are we? So Marvin talked about, uh, what's our uh, view on here? What does this generalize? Not a system I'm familiar with. Okay, you all manage. Uh, Marvin talked about this one uh, the uh, Ed Bush's global gag rule against birth control that was blocked by Verizon that he wrote uh, about. Again, where do you meet people? What is the form in which you communicate? Um, one of the fascinating things is how the particular set of devices and networks do or don't permit openness. So if you look here in Occupy Oakland, you've got A, the live streaming, which is critical to building the connection, and B, the necessity of building your own network based on unlicensed spectrum, Wi-Fi, in order to be able to work around any constraints that others would be. You build your own network around it, but it becomes an integral part of the organization, building your space for speech 
becomes an integral part of the framework as compared to this platform that runs on proprietary infrastructure over a proprietary device with a proprietary operating system using digital restrictions management that can determine what does and doesn't run. So you can have this letter to this particular person who says, thank you for submitting news queues to the App Store. We reviewed news queues and determined that we can't post this version of your iPhone application to the App Store because it contains content that ridicules public figures. And as long as the platform by which we communicate with each other is one that is governed by terms of service, and as long as we conceive as application of terms of service as just private law, not something that implicates the First Amendment, this is acceptable. This is acceptable. And then, of course, it's easy to translate that into blocking from the App Store this app that is a game that exhibits the Foxconn uh, suicides by workers on the production line of the iPhone, which again is blocked as an app. Because, needless to say, it's inconvenient for this device to tell the story of its own human misery and its production. Do we care about this? Well, the WikiLeaks app was pulled, although there was some jailbreaking that allowed it to come in. What this does is it opens up a space for a new public-private partnership in censorship where government uses its influence over private parties to achieve constraint of speech. No ridicule of public figures wasn't done at the administration's request. But here we have, I call on any other company or organization that is hosting WikiLeaks to immediately terminate its relationship with them. WikiLeaks illegal, outrageous, and reckless acts have compromised our national security and put lives at risk around the world. How many lives have we known now after a year and a half? Still no payment systems. Still hounded. What we're seeing is a universal use creation of spaces for that are private spaces for speech that are absolutely necessary for communication that then become the subject of constraint by either private parties in defense of their own uh, interests or by an unholy alliance between public actors who informally lean on private actors to use that doctrinal freedom from the First Amendment to shut down materials. And we've seen now with SOFA and PIPA the willingness of the government not only to have it in one context, but to generalize, to generalize the approach of focusing on private parties and telling them to shut things down. Because they are inconvenient, but they cannot be directly shut down by them. This is the platform of political mobilization. This is the platform of political action. This is what the 21st century is. The press and the public state and public uh, 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 forum. This is where we are. We're not elsewhere. One of the things that Marvin does beautifully in this piece and earlier pieces is walk us through the sheer implausibility of saying a First Amendment law that really started to change in 1925 and is a creation of the 20th century is built around a core of pamphleteers and door-to-door -door, uh, knocking and to some extent later half of the century uh, press but not telephone, not broadcast, not cable, not satellite. Those are all exceptions. What you're seeing is ideological insistence on excluding evidence to the contrary to be able to tell a coherent story that sees the government as the threat and refuses to see the threat as power whether government or money. Whereas in fact, and what he does beautifully in this piece is walk us through how when you actually look at the doctrine as opposed to the ideology that tears off the doctrine to the side, throughout most of the platforms that influenced most of what we knew and how we came to know it, reality trumped ideology. Reality meant that courts said, well, broadcast is big. Cable is big. Telephone, well, that's Telegraph, eh, 
you guys did. Saturday night, we're looking for like king. Oh, conference. So reality has a way of pushing its own way. But what we've seen is what my dear friend and colleague Jack Balkin called, about other areas of the law, ideological drift. Starting in the 19th century idea of freedom of contract drifting to becoming essentially from something that was about free labor and not indentured servitude to something that was about shutting down the progressive state. And that didn't break down because of a doctrinal change. It broke down because of the incoherence of that doctrine in the face of the New Deal and ultimately an acceptance by a Supreme Court justice to just flip in the other way. In the same way that the difference from Bowers versus Hardwick to Lawrence versus Texas is fundamentally what is acceptable within polite, decent company to say about gay and lesbian human beings. And I think one of the things that happens to us now is that as the 21st century comes along and we come to see where are the people, and we come to see what happens when a First Amendment that is fundamentally about protecting against the government. And we end up with Citizens United. After 25 years or 30 years from Buckley versus Valero, we end up with Citizens United. Like, uh, First Amendment that protects the rights of money to speak, first and foremost. As the same First Amendment that allows the telephone companies to make an argument plausibly, not implausibly, plausibly, and win in a couple of courts of appeals uh, over a decade ago, the claim that when they're common carriers for data and they're common carriers for text, if they happen to be carrying video, suddenly it's a First Amendment problem if they're told to also be partially common carriers for that. That's incoherent with the way in which the First Amendment really operates in the 21st century. And that incoherence, and the idea that the First Amendment has become a tool to prevent opening up the actual spaces in which we actually speak to each other and supporting money rather than speech is the incoherence that will ultimately force things to be turned around. And I don't know if it will happen tomorrow. And one of the nice things about what you've done in this piece is that you've provided a ladder for judges and justices to begin to climb down from what is palpably the wrong way to think about the First Amendment in the 21st century. Because the, first, because the 21st century the First Amendment is Linda from Las Vegas. Today it's 350,000 people who look at her video in her bathrobe, standing quietly in front of a camera and telling the Susan G. Cohen Foundation what breast cancer is and what breast cancer isn't. For four minutes and 40 seconds, she tells about what it is to have cancer and what it isn't. What is left and right is not what it is. And any First Amendment standard that suggests that this is not, first and foremost, what the debate is about, where you can say, well, it's streaming media. I'm blocking that, or I'm slowing that down. And that's a speech right for a company. But not this is an unstable doctrine, and is a doctrine that will have to give way. And it will give way, in part, through people providing, as Marvin did, a path for judges to do it in a professionally acceptable way. But it will give, give way in large part because it's incoherent with the way we speak with each other and participate as citizens.